Hi, I'm Jimmy Buffett. There's a reason people like me write songs about South Florida. Why generations of people have been drawn here from the Native Americans, to the Spanish explorers from early pioneers, to several U.S. presidents and heads of state. The history of Florida goes back way before Plymouth Rock. It has endured hurricanes, shipwrecks, war, and devastating epidemics. It not only survived, it thrived. It is a place that turns tragic into magic. Even our palm trees were delivered by shipwreck when the Spanish brig Providencia ran aground a short distance from here. After a man named Henry Flagler transformed this area with his railroad and resorts, up sprang the city of West Palm Beach. And in 1916, a beautiful neoclassical courthouse was built right in the heart of it all. The building has borne witness to 100 years of stories you can't even make up. Sensational trials that chronicle remarkable times and extraordinary lives. The building itself faced near destruction, but it was saved in the nick of time by people who recognized it for the unique treasure it is. It is the heart and soul of this place many people, including me, call paradise. So come share this journey with me as we celebrate 100 years of history, Palm Beach County style. Refugees fill the hallways of the Palm Beach County Courthouse. Thousands dead and entire towns washed away as the hurricane continues its path of destruction. This is the story of disaster and revival, of murder and revenge, wealth, fame, and infamy. The story of an architectural treasure surviving through disaster and near destruction to reveal the secrets of what many call paradise. Hello, I'm Rick Gonzalez. I had the honor of restoring this magnificent landmark, once earmarked for demolition. Within these walls echo the history of a place many describe as paradise, a place where presidents and many other celebrities come to play. Palm Beach is a barrier island, often topping the list of the nation's wealthiest zip codes, with mansions averaging $5.8 million and an avenue called Worth, with shops rivaling the famed Rodeo Drive. Palm Beach is a magnet for the rich and famous. Mar-a-Lago is called the Winter White House for President Trump and First Lady Melania. Palm Beach was also a special place for President John F. Kennedy and his family. His father, Joseph P. Kennedy Sr., bought the famous Kennedy compound in 1933. Aside from the obvious natural beauty, mansions, and warm climate, what is it that draws people who could truly live anywhere to South Florida? Ask homegrown movie star Burt Reynolds. I always come back because I tell people when the, when the plane hits ground coming back, my blood pressure drops about eight points. I feel good here. Before making movies such as Smokey and the Bandit, Deliverance, Boogie Nights and Cannonball Run, Burt Reynolds grew up in Palm Beach County. He went to high school just blocks away from the historic Palm Beach County Courthouse, and like most teenagers, got into a bit of mischief, including visits to Mar-a-Lago, at that time the home of Marjorie Merriweather Post and daughter, movie star Dina Merrill. What we used to do in the summertime, when everybody was uh, gone, we would go into the beach house and then open a door go underneath the highway and up into Mar Largo. And I remember years later, I was asked to, to be shown around by uh, Mrs. Post. And she said, let me show you around. Now this, I said, I know, this, this was your daughter's room. She said, how do you do that? And I said, I've been here before. And I didn't tell her why or how, I just mentioned it. Palm
Palm Beach resident James Patterson, author of more than 147 novels, including 114 New York Times bestsellers, finds inspiration from the natural beauty of South Florida. It's as close to paradise as I think you can get on, uh, on this earth. What really makes it for me is, is just natural beauty and water. The thing about the water is, every day it's a different color and a different texture. And uh, so it's a different painting every day, uh, which, which is quite marvelous. Since I've been here, uh, my output has increased tremendously. So I'm writing more than I ever did, uh, enjoying it more than I ever did. So uh, uh, Florida has been very good for me. But Palm Beach County was not always yachts, mansions, and landmarks. It was a tangle of mangroves, swamps, and mosquitoes, a rugged place inhabited for at least 10,000 years by various Native American tribes. We know that Native Americans have been living in Florida for at least the last 14,000 years. Here in Palm Beach County, we have evidence for at least 8,000 years of occupation. We know very little about them. This is actually one of the last black holes of American archaeology. Uh, so little work has been done here that every day we're finding new things out across all of South Florida. As the county's historic preservation officer, Christian Davenport's job is unearthing clues to reveal how Florida's Native Americans lived prior to any written history. The land that most people see as Palm Beach County today was actually underwater and swamps and sloughs and it would have been very difficult to get around by foot. Uh, water transportation had to be the main way they did and it, they traveled great distances doing that. Although resources such as water were plentiful, survival was far from easy. Don't romanticize the past, because it was very, very difficult. Everything here was hard. It was swampy, it was snaky, there were mosquitoes, there was fevers. None of the conveniences that we have today were here. European settlers' arrival to Palm Beach County began when Ponce de Leon set foot on dry land, somewhere here in the Jupiter Inlet. The Jupiter Lighthouse is the oldest structure in Palm Beach County. It was urgently needed because of the ever-frequent shipwrecks. Thanks to a Quaker merchant named Jonathan Dickinson, we have a first-hand account of one such ordeal. In 1696, Dickinson set sail from Port Royal, Jamaica with his crew and family, including his wife and six-month-old son. On September 24th, a powerful storm slammed the ship ashore in what is today called Hove Sound. What made Jonathan Dickinson's journal so incredibly important is it's not just a mention on the map. It provides the first description of what contact period or early pioneer colonial period history was like here, what daily life was like. And he paints a pretty gruesome picture for most Europeans. First off, they were shipwrecked after a hurricane, and they, they lived on the beach for a while. And then the Native Americans came and took them captive and marched them down to where we think is a local site here. Their clothes were removed from them. They were pretty horrified about that. Most of these people are Quakers. They're very conservative people. Um, so to be nude was quite a shock. Subsequent pioneers settled in the area between Jupiter and Hypoluxo, which back then was called the Lake Worth region. Marion Dimmick Greer's family was among the early settlers and according to her memoirs, expected a Garden of Eden, but found the place both treacherous and wild. Oh, desolation, what a place to travel weary days and nights to find. Between the mosquitoes, unforgiving heat, and hurricanes that came with no warning, the early settlers were scarce on supplies and largely cut off from contact with the rest of the world. Supplies and necessities came, of all places, from shipwrecks. Even our coconut palms were delivered by shipwreck when the Spanish brig Providencia ran aground in 1878 and some 20,000 coconuts washed ashore. 
Slowly, the settlements took shape and the population quickly grew. By 1880, Ian Cap Demick opened Lake Worth's first hotel, the Coconut Grove House. As the settlements grew, so did the need for mail delivery. However, with no roads or highways, a letter from Jupiter to Miami took six to eight weeks. But in 1885, someone had a better idea. We obviously had no roads, no railroad, no intercoastal waterway. It was a thick jungle in between. The solution to that was to hire one man to walk the mail down the beach to what is today Miami. And it took him three days to walk there, three days to walk back. He rested a day on a Sunday and started all over again. One of the barefoot mailmen actually lost their lives at one of the inlets and ended up drowning, crossing, because somebody had used his boat. So it could be very dangerous. It was about 7,000 miles of walking a year. He was paid $600 a year to do it. Not surprisingly, none of these mail carriers ever attempted to renew their contract. Uh, it, it was a pretty brutal way to earn $600 a year. Until 1893, South Florida continued to be a wild and life-defying place developed by sheer grit and determination. But after a man named Flagler built a railroad, Palm Beach County entered a gilded age of incredible wealth. No one could have dreamed of what was to become of this harsh and primitive place when a force seemingly larger than life itself arrived in South Florida. Flagler's railroad absolutely changed Florida, especially South Florida. He did truly open us up to development, opened up our agricultural legacy. Our agricultural industry in this county is a third of our economy every year, still to this day. Just east of his railroad along the West Palm Beach waterfront, Flagler donated land that later became the site of a new courthouse. In 1916, the Palm Beach County Courthouse was built. It was to become far more than a place for legal proceedings. It provided refuge for those seeking shelter from devastating hurricanes. It is where couples married, people were judged, a place where hopes and dreams were launched or crushed. The hopes and aspirations of the people that moved to Florida to live the dream, this is where it started for all of them. This is where our local government was integrated. This is where we had our first African-American judge. So this building, if any one building in Palm Beach County could be selected as the building that represents everyone, this was that building. In 1917, the historic Palm Beach County Courthouse was officially complete. And if only the walls could speak. It has seen over 100 years of inspiration and tragedy including the murder of one of the county's most respected judges. Ernest Chillingworth was the judge of judges. One morning he didn't show up for work. Nobody could figure out why. Sheriff's office sent deputies down to his home in Manalapan. They found a broken light and they found some blood on on the stairs leading to the beach, and they didn't know anything for five years. Finally, a break in the case. It came out finally that a municipal court judge had hired these two men to kidnap Mr. and Mrs. Chillingworth, although Mrs. Chillingworth wasn't supposed to be there. It took both of them so there'd be no witnesses, and wrapped Mrs. Chillingworth in chains and dumped her overboard and then wrap the anchor around Mr. Chillingworth and dumped him overboard as well. The building bore witness to another death, and there is even talk of a ghost. There was a suicide in the building in 1918. Our uh, supervisor of schools was Guy Metcalf. They were gonna charge him with a crime. It had to do with money. Metcalf had been a pillar of the community. He made one final plea to the authorities. He asked for one more night at home to be with his family. 
and he told his family he had to go to work. Well, sometime during the night, he used a handgun to shoot himself. He was found the next morning before dawn by the janitor. We've had several visitors claim that, that they feel a presence in our building. One lady walked in our front door and she got barely five feet past the front door and she stopped and started screaming. And she couldn't get any further into the building. She couldn't explain why she felt this way, but her daughter had to take her home. She couldn't stay. Back in the early part of the century, court was held a bit differently than today. The community came and enjoyed the most sensational trials as they would theater. The year was 1925, and a sheriff named Baker and his wife, a 38-year-old mother of three, were embroiled in a sensational divorce trial. What transpired within the walls of the courtroom would shock the courtroom and the community. The state of Florida calls Sheriff Robert Clarence Baker to the stand. Sheriff Baker deserves a show all his own. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. It would have been the trial of the decade in our Palm Beach County Courthouse. I will ask you, if while ever you live together, have you ever pulled a pistol on her? I have never drawn a pistol on her or made a threat of any kind or anything similar to that. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. You had the pistol and you were scrambling for it? I had it, yes. And you say, he was trying to make you shoot yourself. Yes. They came at me from behind and had me pinned to the ground. Julia was there. She was screaming. But I had my gun, and I pulled it out, and I held it to her, and I told her. And I said, shoot. We could both go to hell together. Back to what was happening in Palm Beach County. The year is 1926, the county is growing, hotels and mansions grace Palm Beach Island, luxury and style from the ground up. But no one could imagine what was to come just two years later. The 1928 hurricane was the, the second deadliest natural disaster in the United States. Unfortunately, people didn't have a chance to prepare. And that hurricane cut across the peninsula and hit Lake Okeechobee. And the winds came through and pushed all of that water back towards the southeast. When it did, it sent a wall of water crashing into everything that was there. It just devastated the area. Entire towns were swept away as floodwaters as high as 20 feet destroyed everything in its path. Between 2,500 and 3,000 people died that day, making it the second deadliest natural disaster in U.S. history. In the first days, they were able to bury people in coffins, and then the need for coffins quickly outstripped what they could create, and they literally would spread lime and start a fire right there and let them burn in place. In spite of the ruins and rubble around it, the courthouse survived the storm and continued to thrive. After the land boom following World War I, the courthouse ran out of room, so they built an identical building right next door. And that worked well until the next great period of expansion. As the post-World War II population boom continued to explode, the Palm Beach County Courthouse became too small. The introduction of companies such as Pratt & Whitney, IBM, RCA, and Motorola further fueled the population spurt. So, the county commission did what most county commissions would have done. The least expensive alternative was to wrap these three other buildings and make it a larger building. So imagine a building with a second building next to it, then later connected by a third building, and finally 
wrapped by a fourth building. The wraparound was started in 1969 and finished in 1972. Turning a neoclassical building into a 1970s box with few windows did not come without controversy. And this building was no stranger to controversy. At that time, segregation was still common throughout the state of Florida. Inside the courthouse, bathrooms were designated for white or black, and African Americans were seated separately in the balcony. But in 1973, Edward Rogers became the first African American judge in Palm Beach County. I was sort of a showcase, so to speak, as I said, I could. I was sitting on the bench sometime and I'd see people like you come by the hall, pass by my office, and as you pass by, you slow up to maintain the image. Today, Rogers reflects on how much change has occurred. Quite a bit, quite a bit of change. It's, uh, I am living in a senior citizens group, which I could only have worked in 25 years ago. I go over to Palm Beach for lunch, where in the same place where I could have been arrested. I go to the hospital where I could not have been treated. Of course, it hasn't been fast enough for many of us in the minority. After 22 years of breaking ground and working to establish equality in the courtroom, Judge Rogers retired. The courthouse went on to become its own source of controversy. Despite all it had been through, the next time the courthouse became too small, it was slated for destruction. But a dedicated group of local professionals decided to do whatever it took to save it. And we have seven county commissioners, and they voted six to one to tear down the building. I voted against it and uh, went up to my office and called Harvey Oyer and said, we, this is, it's not over, let's, let's fix this. And worked with Harvey and others to change the sentiment on the commission. I went to schools, rotary clubs, Kiwanis clubs, churches, temples, anyone who would listen to the pitch and solicit endorsement letters and overwhelmingly they all endorsed it. They wrote in thousands or tens of thousands of letters and overwhelmed the one commissioner who said, I don't think the public is interested in this. After being wrapped for several decades, the first step was finding out if the building was even salvageable. Harvey Oyer managed to get $50,000 from the county to do an evaluation. So I had to find two qualified people to help do that, and I found Rick Gonzalez, a historic preservation architect, and Dale Hedrick, who owns a company called Hedrick Brothers Construction Company. They've done lots of historic restoration work in the state of Florida. Well, the, the building had been unoccupied for 10 years. It had not had any power to it. There's no air conditioning to it. We knew that there was roof leaks. We knew there was water leaks. We knew that it had been neglected. And so we walked in with flashlights and trying to figure out what was there. Just trying to size it up um, was very challenging. Ironically, the wraparound that offended so many played an important role in preserving the building. We went in and randomly sampled different parts of the building to see how much of the floors, the ceilings, the walls were left intact. And remarkably, a very high percentage was left intact. When you restore a building, it's like going on a treasure hunt. You never know what you're gonna get. And th this was um, the mother of all treasures in, for our county. The goal was not to renovate, but rather to restore the courthouse to its original neoclassical magnificence. The search for original vendors to replace whatever had been lost was not an easy one. Uh, this is prior to Google or any search, search engines, and so it was a lot of investigating through different magazines and so forth, and a lot of phone calls to, to locate uh, these materials. 
Robin Lunsford was the project manager for Hedrick and was literally flying blind on what went where until an important discovery was made. As we had no blueprints in the project, it was remarkable that after peeling two layers of vinyl back off of the floors, we found the original mosaic floor intact 95%, which created a roadmap and a plan for us to put the interiors back the way they were historically. People started coming to us who knew the history of the courthouse, and they started telling us where bits and pieces of the, the, the courthouse was uh, moved to. And we were able to put them together and make it work. The original stonework on the west facade of the courthouse was removed during the wraparound. Robin Lunsford tracked the stonework down to its source, a limestone quarry in Indiana. We located the original quarry that supplied the matching stone for the building, and they had the Crown Select Indiana Buff limestone that was required uh, to match to um, restore the, the stone around the building. The limestone unique to this quarry is that the Empire State Building and the Washington Monument were um, supplied from that same quarry. After over a century of operation, that quarry was shutting down. And the very last order that they filled was our order. And had we ordered it one day, one second later, we would not have had uh, an identical chemical match of the stone that was originally there in 1916 and the stone that is there today. The renovation of the courthouse was painstaking. The first step was demolishing the 1969 wraparound. As they demolished the walls of the wraparound, the Hedrick construction crew worked tirelessly salvaging everything they could from the 1927 edition for use in the restoration of the 1916 courthouse. After the demolition, a team of architects, contractors, and engineers inspected what was left of the original 1916 building and found they were unearthing history. Although damaged, there were stunning remnants of this once regal masterpiece. The team carried out many walkthrough inspections, assessing what could be salvaged, and came up with a plan. In January 2005, the restoration began. Twelve limestone columns were located, restored, and installed, each weighing 30,000 pounds. Seventy-six original windows were restored, repaired, and brought up to Hurricane Cove. The north, south, and west granite and limestone porticos were recreated from photographs. To match what was remaining of the original bricks, the construction team stained 51,400 custom-made brick replacements. Walls were replaced. Stairwells rebuilt. And the original 1916 safe doors were salvaged in place. In December 2006, Palm Beach County officials held a ceremony to celebrate the installation of the original cornerstone to the northwest corner. The historic cornerstone was dedicated to Henry Flagler, who donated the land the courthouse rests upon. In 2007, a design for the courtroom, based on a tour of other courthouses from the same time period, was approved. Everything from the plaster ceilings, the maple flooring, to the windows and the judge's bench were to be replicated.
When the restoration was complete, the results were stunning. We have granite, we have limestone, we have brick, uh, very intricate design patterns. You can spend 30 minutes, an hour, just looking at it. And to me, the beauty of architecture, the timelessness of architecture, is when you can experience that. On March 15, 2008, the restoration was complete and the courthouse opened as the Richard and Pat Johnson Palm Beach County History Museum and home to the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. That day the museum opened was a fantastic day. It was a dream come true for many, many people. The museum is free to visitors, hosts thousands of school children every year, and has rotating exhibitions. For the Johnsons, funding the museum was an act of love. I was felt like that I had always been very fortunate to live here, my husband and I both, and we felt like we were sharing our good luck and fortune with our friends and people that had moved here. And in the end, this beautiful building stands on a street named Dixie, a monument to the men and women whose resolve and accomplishments went into making Palm Beach County what it is today and setting the stage for our future. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of this historic Palm Beach County Courthouse a spectacular landmark that truly embodies the spirit of American history and culture. A place where the past echoes in these hallways and the people and events that shaped our past to the visionaries leading us into the future. The history of Palm Beach County is also both magic and tragic. And for generations has drawn everyone from pioneers to presidents to, well, performers like me. So thank you for taking this journey with me. I'm Jimmy Buffett. Ends up.